And we're live, everyone. So hello and welcome to episode number 12 of WP Cafe, the show where we chat with WordPress professionals about practical solutions for solo and small WordPress development teams. If this sounds like you and you don't want to miss out on a single value-packed episode of WP Cafe, then subscribe right now to the High Rise Digital YouTube channel. And we also release lots of other WordPress development videos, which we hope you'll also find useful. If you haven't already subscribed, we also have a podcast too. Um, you'll find WP Cafe on your favourite podcast provider. And this episode will be available shortly after we've finished today. Um, you should also definitely follow us on Twitter for updates on upcoming shows, as well as snippets from this and past shows. We are WP Cafe Show. Today's episode is sponsored by Easy Digital Downloads. Easy Digital Downloads is a WordPress plugin that allows you to sell your digital products using WordPress. From eBooks to WordPress plugins to PDF files and more, Easy Digital Downloads makes selling digital products a breeze. It's simple to use and it's free to download, so get started today. And with a suite of add-ons, Easy Digital Downloads allows you to run your very own fully functional WordPress uh, software store. And we do this at High Rise Digital using Easy Digital Downloads along with software licensing add-on and recurring billing to sell annual subscriptions to our WordPress plugins and job relay service. And I'm sure we'll get into this in the topic today as well. It also integrates with your favorite software such as MailChimp, Zapier, Slack, Stripe, and PayPal, just to mention a few. So if you're selling digital products online and you wanna use WordPress, then Easy Digital Downloads is an absolute must. You can find out more at easydigitaldownloads.com. So on to today's show. In this episode, we're talking about making money with WordPress plugins. I think a lot of us think of selling plugins and products as some kind of holy grail in the uh, WordPress space. Something like stick a plugin on the repo when it gets really popular, release the premium version, watch the cash roll in and then retire to somewhere hot like Costa Rica. That is the dream anyway. But what does selling WordPress plugins look like in reality? How do you come up with plugin ideas? Do you use the WordPress repo or go straight to a paid product? How do you market your plugin? What tech do you need to sell them and manage subscriptions? How much money can you really make selling plugins? What are the general trends in the industry and how we can find the next big thing? Today, we'll be discussing all of this and more with our two guests, Ian Poulsen and James Kemp. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So let's learn a little bit more about you both. I'll start with you, Ian. Uh, can you tell us who you are, your story with WordPress, how you ended up being involved in selling WordPress plugins, and just a little icebreaker question, your hot beverage of choice. Mm, nice. <laughs> right, yeah, no, thanks for having me. Yeah, as you said, I'm Ian Paulson. Um, I'm a product manager at Delicious Brains, which are a WordPress plugin product company um, with the makers of WP Migrate DB Pro and Spin Up WP. Um, I, and I also sell my own WordPress plugins, um, an Instagram plugin called Integrate, and a membership and community plugin called WP User Manager. Uh, I first started WordPress using WordPress in 20, 2008, 2009, um, but it, it kind of really got serious in 2011. Uh, I set up a blog for my uh, for, for myself and my girlfriend now wife um, to share photos with family sort of an alternative to being on Facebook basically um, but she really got into Instagram and loved using it but there wasn't really a, like an easy way to share her photos from Instagram to our WordPress blog and she basically just said can you not do something about this can you not just set up something to do this for me uh, and so I just started to build a plugin that did that job you know created a WordPress post every time you post to Instagram um, and yeah I released a premium version in 2012 it made around 12k in six months and i thought holy what wow this is good this is you know there's there's something here um and i've kind of not left the wordpress space since i eventually moved from my it contract job to freelancing with wordpress and now obviously working for a wordpress product company um and i acquired wps manager in 2019 uh, and that's kind of been my main side focus since then and i've Sort of been growing that revenue since then so yeah that's i'm i'm, I'm loving wordpress plugins basically that's awesome what about your hot, hot beverage, beverage of choice <laughs> it, currently nothing i'm i'm on water at the moment but it was yeah. coffee earlier yeah coffee black coffee what kind of coffee are you a coffee snob or just instant or I am, the... I am not a coffee snob but it's as easy as possible it's two nespresso pods 
and that's it. Just straight. <laughs> that's far more complicated than my coffee. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, everyone comes straight out of a jar into a cup with the sugar in, a bit of milk and then water. Job done. <laughs> oh, yeah, but I just push buttons. That's easy. It's oh, two, right two right shots. <laughs> Nice. All right, cheers, Ian. And uh, and James, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and your background with WordPress and with WordPress plugins and your favorite hot drink? I can. Uh, it's pretty similar to Ian, actually. But um, yeah, I'm James Kemp, uh, currently the founder of Iconic WP, where we make WooCommerce plugins. We've got like 14 premium plugins uh, on our website, iconicwp.com. Um, started out again 2009, similar to, to Ian, uh, which was kind of, I think, when, when WordPress was making a, a bit of a name for itself. Um, in 2011, uh, again, I made a, a plugin, a premium plugin called Multiple Images Per Variation for WooCommerce. It was a, it was a pretty hefty name for a plugin, but it, it described exactly what it needed to do. Um, and that came about because I was working for a company uh, and one of our clients needed to be able to assign multiple images to a product variation, which still isn't possible in WooCommerce. Um, and actually we still have that that plugin today. It's called WooThumbs now. Um, and that is one of the many features that that plugin offers. Um, left that company went freelance started an agency still you know working pretty deeply with wordpress and woocommerce uh joined delicious brains for a little while <laughs> with ian um working on their website and then kind of jumped off of that in about 2017 i think uh, and just focused fully on iconic i kind of rebranded uh because prior to that, I was selling on uh, Code Canyon mm. as, you know, uh, just like a starting point, really. It was, I think it was pretty popular back in 2012, that mm. kind of time. Um, so, yeah, I, I moved away from there, and now I'm here. And my favorite hot beverage, um, I don't really drink hot beverages, but if I was to, I'd probably get a hot chocolate or something. Good. We've we've got one of those uh, velvetizers from Hotel Chocolat. A velvetizer? What yeah, is that? You, try it. <laughs> you basically pour in solid chocolate flakes, and it just mixes it and heats it wow. up with milk. Oh my goodness, that's okay. amazing! So yeah. <laughs> Give Thanks for that. <laughs> Put that in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just before we get into the show, just to mention, I know there are some of you watching along on YouTube Live, so thank you very much for that. And if you have any questions for James and for Ian, then please, if you want to pop them in the chat, um, it's top right of my screen. I, I guess it depends on what device you're looking at it on, but you'll find it somewhere. Uh, and we'll try and we'll try and ask them those during the course of the show. Uh, and if you're enjoying what you do, what you're seeing, then please hit the like button. It helps us out a lot. Keith. Cool. I'm struggling to know exactly where to start with this. My my initial first question was going to be about how to find a new opportunity. Um, but actually, I feel like we need to set the scene a little bit. And I guess I, I, want, I want to create a picture of what a plugin business might look like and maybe the different types of plugin businesses there are and, you know, the industry as a, as a whole. Um, Ian, Ian, first, are you? How much of your current personal revenue comes from WordPress plugins that you you own and, and run? Uh, it's it's been changing over the last year or so, but it's it's over half now, which is yep. good, um, and it's it's growing. Um, but yeah, it's it's I, I'm obviously a solo developer mm -hmm. um, on my plugins. This year, and a little into the back end of last year, I've been trying to find freelancers to help me do development because you've kind of got infinite hours in the day, and I'm yeah. still working the majority of the week for Delicious Brains. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, you're right in terms of the different types of plugin cut size companies because yeah. you've got you've got solo devs who are bootstrapping it themselves, and that's their their only thing they do, mm -hmm. and you've got people who I guess similar to me that are have things, but they 
are outsourcing to help and to grow and then you've got dedicated companies that are various sizes and 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 really people who are making you know big money from wordpress plugins and plugin shops that are dedicated to um creating one or multiple plugins yeah um, that are really successful you know like the gravity forms the ninja forms the mm. the guy or the awesome motive guys that have multiple plugins that are, are doing sort of big business mm-hmm. um so it's, it's there's a real spectrum yeah okay and and james are you are you 100 you know wordpress plugins is that what your business is and does now like yeah in its entirety yep yeah we're um 100 percent. yeah plugins we, we don't do any you know custom development or anything we're just uh focused on the products yeah how big is how big is your team um so there's three developers including myself um to support people uh someone that does marketing and that's it yeah yeah so i guess i mean i guess the picture we're painting is that um it can be big business <laughs> you know there's there's very very large companies now and you know um it's not just something that people do on the side anymore and, and earn a few quid here and there it's it's you know it's there's a lot of money in this in this industry and um i think we'll get into the trends and stuff um industry trends a little bit more further on in the show um okay so then back back to the start if if i was a WordPress developer looking to get into the product plugin space. How do how do you go about that? How do you come up with that next idea? I, mean, I think this is like the real gold, really, isn't it? It's this is the thing everyone really wants to know is like how how do you how do you find something that is going to be a viable business going forward? Like what kind of steps might you take um, if you were starting from scratch? James, have you got any any tips on that? Yeah, I mean, you kind of heard from our intros that we we both started out in a similar way that we were solving someone's need. You know, we, uh, we were both developers and we both had a client, I guess, for, um, <laughs> uh, in, in my case, it was a client, um, yeah. who had some kind of issue that, that needed resolving. Um, and that is probably how maybe 30% of our products, if not more, came about. Yeah. Um, you know, from a client, they needed this solution. There was no real good solution. Uh, at least that's, I think, how you could start back then. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like there's there's different ways to go about it today. Okay. Um, you've obviously got, you know, Ian's got a, a nice newsletter, WP Trends. Um, Justin Ferryman has a good newsletter as well, actually, which he sent out a, a post yesterday, I think it was, that kind of detailed good ways to catch trends um, and, you know, come up with, with product ideas. Um, but for WooCommerce specifically, they've also got uh, an ideas board, um, which is a nice place to kind of go and scour for problems that people are having. If you don't necessarily have your own clients, oh, that's great. Uh, you can you can find you know, hundreds of problems that people are having and see how popular that, that problem is. Yeah. So originally, That's James, nice you point. were you were doing client work, solving client problems and then packaging up the solutions to those problems as plugins that you could resell effectively. Yeah, we, we were building websites. Um, yeah. And part of that build would be, you know, the, the website needs to do this. So for, with my We Thumbs example, uh, they needed to add multiple images to a uh, variation um, with delivery slots, which is one of our more popular plugins that we built that for uh, uh, an Indian down in Brighton, yeah. uh, Indian restaurant. Um, they basically wanted to be able to offer their customers the ability to choose a, a time to receive their takeaway or a time to come and pick up their takeaway. Uh, and over the years, that's obviously evolved based on when you get more customers in uh, and they're dropping in, you know, feature requests and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. So now that you've transitioned, like, to purely uh, plugins, are you, I'm assuming you're not doing any kind of direct client work anymore, is that correct? Um, that's right. 
how are you coming up with the ideas today um, if you're not kind of solving those client problems and that's kind of generating the ideas for you? I mean, how, how would you how would you go about that today? Or have have you, I mean, have, have, you have you had to do yeah, that? Yeah, we've 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 built new plugins based on you know trends that that we see just by being active in the community. Mm. Um, you know, we're on the uh, Facebook groups that you get for for WooCommerce. Um, and you can kind of, you get an idea by being on them of what people are looking for, um, you know what what issues they're facing without mm-hmm. them being your direct client, uh, and you can kind of formulate patterns based on that. But um, the other route we've taken is to acquire products that you know already exist and aren't necessarily uh, performing as well as they could be. So Flux is is an example of that, which is our checkout plugin. Yeah. Um, yeah. We we acquired that uh, early last year, so just before the pandemic. Um, and yeah, we we got a good deal for that, and and we kind of implemented it into our own structure of of plugins, um, and have you know done pretty well with with that method of coming up with ideas. I guess you'd that's call really it. cool. How did you how did you find Flux? Was that something you were actively looking for at the time, or or did you kind of happen across it and then the opportunity sparked, or it was a bit more deliberate? It was. Um, I'm in a Facebook group as well called Selling WordPress Products. Uh, I think Vova at Freemius maybe set it up, or mm. he's involved in some way. Um, and they had posted on there that they were looking to sell. Uh, the, the group's actually meant to be for people who sell WordPress plugins as a business, but I think people right. have misunderstood the name and they often post, you know, products that they're selling. Yeah. Um, so I saw it on there, basically, and just reached out to the guy. Uh, he actually worked at a company that used a lot of our plugins anyway, so yeah, he was he was familiar. That's great. Ian, have you got anything um, anything to add to to James's examples there of, of ways you might kind of come up with ideas and for a new plugin? Yeah, I think I was going to say obviously similar to James that I started building plugins, scratching my own itch and having a problem to solve. And I think, like James mentioned, that was good back then when mm. you know the market wasn't so busy with plugins and so saturated. And probably nowadays, you think I've got this problem. How can I solve it? And there's already a plugin for it. So yeah. you kind of think, oh, well, you know, if I was to build it, what's the point? But actually, I think you can look at it the other way and think, well, you know, the, there is a really big ecosystem of plugins and there are lots of plugins doing the same job. If you think of forms plugins, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the market is um, blocked off to you. Why not? you know, take an existing plugin that maybe is doing a lot of things and try and create a simplified version of it. Um, you know, the fact that multiple plugins exist in a space doesn't mean that you can't enter it and, um, you know, there's an opportunity there to make a bit of money, get some get some users on it. Um, yeah. it, it. I guess that's just validation that there are a lot of users. And that when you think about the WordPress, um, the WordPress world and how much of the web is powered by wordpress that's a huge number of people that are searching for plugins that you know there's the the pie is massive that you can everybody could get a slice of i think yeah yeah absolutely yeah. uh james you wanted to jump in there yeah it just kind of centered around um if you were to come up with an idea and then discover that um you know someone's already built it or there's there's a popular plugin that does the same thing uh, you can analyze their reviews to get an idea of what is working for their product and what you know you could do differently based on negative feedback for their product. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to you know if you really want to go down that route, you can kind of get a bigger picture um, of what the issues are with the existing solutions. Yeah, so potentially a way to do it, yeah is to take even like to look at the. The WordPress repo, obviously those are free plugins, but look through those and I, I guess set some kind of threshold for, for popularity uh, and then tr- maybe try to find ones that don't have the highest reviews and 
and see if you can solve that problem or even potentially take over that plugin and, and, and develop it it's, um, to a higher level. I guess that's there's an opportunity there. Um, Mark? Uh, yeah, just coming back on that, you mentioned like, uh, you said it then, Keith, like a threshold for whether that's worth worth moving forward with. And I've often thought this thinking about audience, you know, if there's 20,000 active installs of this plugin and then, you know, if we could hit like 1% of those, that'd be this many people. Do you have something similar in your minds when you're taking over or think about taking over a plugin or, or developing an idea? Is it like a, a number that you think, well, I've got to have at least a market of X amount of people or does that not necessarily come into it, Ian? What do you think? Mm, I think you, you would want to have a, as high a number as possible, but I think it's really hard to understand that, say you adopted a free plugin somehow or acquired it, adopted it, um, that had 20,000 active installs. It's very hard to understand, A, how many of those 20,000 are really active, um, and it's going to depend on the plugin. Like, are they touching that plugin every day? Is it something that they might do every three months because it's that kind of a scheduled backup? Plug you know, how active the users are of the plugin. Um, and also, yeah, then understanding if you add some 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 sort of monetization to that plugin, what the percentage will be. You know, your next update to the plugin that adds a banner or some form of opt-in or some form of um, mm -hmm advertisement to your premium offering how much how much of those 20,000 are really going to update in the next yeah. few weeks to that plugin to see that available and then go to your site and then convert or you know then go to the yeah. checkout and then convert it's i think i do think um people overestimate how much the active installs total can can affect um yeah. you know generating revenue yeah. and i think it, there's there's a bit of a trend at the moment where people are quite happy to sell their free plugins where, which they haven't monetized but they have but they are sort of selling it on the back of a large install base and they're overpricing it because they think you know one active install person equates to like a dollar or something mm -hmm. and you it's not quite possible to yeah. you know for somebody to acquire it and then convert to that level um but it's still but it's it is a good way of doing it you've got a a, a channel that you can market to straight out of the gate kind of thing if you take over a plugin like that yeah yeah cool thank you in terms of like just staying on the topic of um evaluating an opportunity are there any anything else that you would look at any uh ways that you can do some market research like what what kind of resources or tools um and things would you be looking at um in terms of evaluating a potential product james uh there's, there's a few things. I mean, if if I was going to start fresh building a product, um, I'd want to make sure that the product either uh, adds value in some way or generates value for the customer um, because they're the ones that, that people are mostly going to buy uh, or, you know, be willing to part with their cash uh, to, to get hold of. Um, and... For me, that means sticking in the the e-commerce world, but there's you know space to mm. do that outside of it. Um, like like Ian's user manager plugin, you know, uh, plugin. That's that's something that people need that functionality, and they need it on an ongoing basis. Um, so with the e-commerce space, something that I haven't really tapped into yet, but you could tap into is kind of analysing the Shopify marketplace. Um, see what what apps are performing well over there uh, mm. that don't necessarily have competitors in the WordPress space. It's it's strange because the, the Shopify marketplace, they they are able to charge monthly what people in the WordPress space would have to charge yearly. Uh, they they have this perceived value of being you know a lot more. Uh, they they can value their products a lot higher than you can in the WordPress space. Or so why I've, I've why do you think that is? I think it's because WordPress is free and people, yeah. you know, come to it and they think, oh, it's free. I don't want to spend any money. And then they realize they do have to start spending money uh, and they want to keep that limited. Whereas with when you're joining Shopify, you know that um, you're, you're kind of have this initial outlay mm. 
uh, of cost anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, that that would that's why I think. Do you think that's do you think that's changing at all in the WordPress uh, industry? It's definitely changing because when I started uh, on Code Canyon, they set the prices for my products. Um, WooThumbs, for example, went on at like eight dollars lifetime. Um, wow. Whereas now it's seventy nine dollars a year, um, yeah, which is much more sustainable. And I I remember back uh, in the Code Canyon days there was a theme um, that kind of broke the mold a bit, and they set their price from something like sixteen dollars to one hundred and ninety nine dollars or something like that. I can't remember what theme it was. Um, but everyone was pretty shocked by it, and I feel like that was kind. Of Kind of the start because people still bought it you know at yeah. that price yeah um and i think as people moved away from that marketplace they kind of realized that they could charge more um and also people kind of adopted the subscription model which means that if you want to maintain uh having a plug-in business you need that subscription model like you yeah. You can't maintain a business with support with developers based on a eight dollar lifetime sale. So it's definitely shifting that way. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Ian, do you want to jump in there, Ian? Yeah, I was going to say, James, it's inter- interesting you're talking about Co Canyon because um, I recently realised and I hadn't looked at it for a while that you can now, as a merchant, set your own prices. And I wondered do, if you yeah. knew when they changed that. And I, I'm assuming that was in you know, in response to the fact that everything has been undercharged severely, um, or underpriced, should I say, and that they're trying to keep people on that platform. It was um, it was when I was leaving, probably within a year of when I left, which was 2017, so maybe 2016, 2017, they, they allowed you to set your own prices. Mm. Um, and it was around that time that... Uh, the the theme that I was just talking about they they just you know went straight out and boosted their 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 price mm-hmm. um, but yeah, yeah. I, I I think when I left Code Canyon mine were probably at about forty nine like I think that was the highest and that was still you know a one off purchase yeah yeah and you still had to pay a, a, a commission fee to Code Canyon quite significant yeah uh, yeah yes yeah, thirty or something like it's that. definitely I mean <laughs> So we're we're just like uh, dipping our toe really at the minute as a business uh, in the in the product space. We've got something that's kind of like moderately successful at the moment. But whenever we whenever we do do some research and we start like looking around, and you, you go onto Code Canyon and you look at the prices and the number of installs, and I often just think, how on earth are these people making any money? Uh, there's there's some massive successes obviously and you, you know you you crunch the numbers and there's like millions of dollars involved but like you know more often than not there aren't um how, what how does a business make any money selling something like a theme or a plugin for you know 30 quid like how does how does that work what are the economics of that ian <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not great economics, but I think the biggest thing for Co Canyon sellers is just the distribution, and they've got a huge marketplace that they can tap into, and they have uh, you know eyes on their plugin that they wouldn't have normally. Mm-hmm. But I think if you if you're trying to grow it and become bigger, then yeah, being on that marketplace is restrictive. But you yeah. still need to have the way to get eyes on your plugin, and you need um, marketing. And I think yeah. that's always something i always come back to is the benefit of having a free version on wordpress.org right because that is a that is the place that people search for plugins you know inherently inside their wordpress site um so having some form of freemium plugin that has a pro version or you know a premium aspect to it on wordpress.org is massive because it's it's a huge marketing channel that i think um people can still take advantage of um uh, I think that's a sorry. great segue then onto the the question on uh, on marketing. Um, so Prashant asks, how are you marketing your plugins? Um, so obviously, well, let's go to James. Uh, you're probably slightly different than I don't. If you've got anything on .org, but um, how are you sort of tackling tackling that aspect? Yeah, all of ours are premium only, 
Um, so we don't get the benefits of, of a freemium uh, model. I agree with Ian that, you know, being on uh, the WordPress repo um, is definitely beneficial because you get, you get eyes on it. Um, but the way we've done it is obviously we started out on Code Canyon. So we had that kind of marketplace um, structure and we started at a point where there wasn't many people on there. Um, I think we were in like the top hundred sellers at the time. So that, mm. that was the big benefit. Um, and whilst doing that, we also had our website running behind the scenes. Uh, these days, what we find works is content marketing. So we put out quite a bit of content centered around how to do X in WooCommerce using our plugin mm. as the solution. Um, yeah. And that kind of content performs the best uh, out of most of the things we tried. And you can create that content for your own site. You can create it as guest posts for other sites, which is what we do. Um, or you can advise your affiliates to create content in, in that manner. Mm. Uh, but these kind of like how-to style posts work really well. <clears throat> and then we can link that into our email marketing. We use ConvertKit um, and we'll send out an email every time there's a new post and just kind of lead people through to the, you know, the, the blog post. Subsequently, they see how to solve an issue and then they go on to take a trial of, of the, the product. Um, and we've got these embedded call to actions within these posts where uh, because we use Freemius, you can basically initiate a trial of the product within the post. It just opens mm -hmm. the, the checkout in a modal. Mm -hmm. um, so that works pretty well. Um, but yeah, as like a kind of bird's eye view, uh, affiliates, content marketing, uh, we do Facebook retargeting. Um, so anyone that's shown like serious intent of wanting to uh, purchase the plugin so they've maybe opened the uh, checkout in our case because we've every product has its own checkout uh, or they viewed the pricing section so we're like very specifically targeting this tiny niche of people that have visited the page uh, and retargeting back at them uh, with adverts that say something along the lines of either a customer testimonial uh, and literally just, you know, their testimonial uh, and an image with a, a snippet out of their testimonial. Mm. Um, or the other one we do is to kind of convince them to take a trial, you know, let them know that we do have trials uh, available. And they convert really well. That's brilliant. Um, yeah. Ian, yeah, that's right. you want to come in? Yeah, I was going to just say, because obviously James is... Uh, quite a, a mature company in terms of you know the length of time, the plugins, yeah. revenue, the team size, and everything, which is great because you've been allowed to, or, you, or you've been able to try different marketing channels mm. and work out which ones do well, focus on others. Um, but I think when it comes to sort of starting from scratch, I think it's important to like choose one channel and try and focus yeah. on that. Like if if you're building a premium only plugin and you're just ignoring WordPress.org, then just double down on content marketing. Just get your site and your blog getting traffic from Google that mm -hmm. is relate you know traffic that has the correct search intent for your product that's going to fit your product. Yeah. Um, and if you are doing a free version, concentrate on the free version on .org and try and support those users amazingly. Try and get all the bugs ironed out. You know you've got almost free testers of your plugin, people who are going to give you um, examples for feature requests that you can then put into the pro version mm. and try and sort of foster that side of it more. Um, so yeah, just just try not to be, because um, I, I do this and I do it all the time, but try not to be affected by the scattergun of like shiny things that you could do Facebook ads, you could do Google ads, you could do pay-per-click, you could do content marketing, you could do affiliates. Like don't try and do... Um, do too much just try and focus and also realize when it's not working and mm. you know move move on to one of the other channels mm. yeah de definitely narrow your focus on 
uh, I'd say one or two. I don't. I think with content marketing, it's it's a long game. You know, you're not going to get results straight away. But you could um, you could uh, complement that with Google Ads if you've got the budget to get those posts. You know, straight up into into Google. Yeah. Uh, and allow them to rank over time. Saying that, we never had any luck with uh, Google Ads. Interesting. So, ju- I just want to, before we move on, dig in just a little bit further into this uh, the WordPress repo versus like uh, other repositories like ThemeForest or whatever. Um, James, you you say you're you're not you don't use you don't have a free version of your plugins on the WordPress repo. Uh, why not? And are you ever thinking about doing that in the future? Would would, would you experiment with that? I've done it in the past. Okay. Um, so we had a, a feature requests board plugin that we sold fairly recently um, that had a free version and a pro version. Yep. Um, why didn't I do it for Iconic? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, it's, it's hard to do, I think. It's hard to determine what's a free feature uh, without giving away too much that people don't yep. need to upgrade uh, and you know what's a premium feature and what deciding what people would actually want to pay for it's 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 a hard decision to make and I think the plugins that we do kind of tackle one uh, one thing which is hard to kind of segregate into free slash premium without you know for example like a, a quick view plugin which yeah. is one of our products uh, I mean, the, the, a lot of themes have them now anyway. So, what do you count as being worthwhile as, as you know, being included in the in the free plugin? Yeah, sure. kind of um, do one thing and do it well plugin. So, how do you yeah. break that into something that's paid for and not? I guess isn't it? It, it is tricky, yeah. But it, it's not off the table completely. It's just um, not something we've necessarily explored. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I think it's difficult, James, for you as well, because like you're building on top of WordPress, but also on top of WooCommerce. Yeah. So you you are nest by the nature of it adding just a feature for each plugin kind of thing to WooCommerce. But then so saying it's that you've quite got hard to you've do got Yith who do the same thing as this, and I would I think all of their plugins are freemium. I agree. Oh, interesting. Um, they've got free and pro versions, so I'm, I'm not sure how. Mm. There, there must be some kind of. Uh, structure to determining what works in free because you you need to give them enough that they want to use it but not too much yeah. that they don't want to upgrade so yeah i ne- I never know which is the best way to do it because if you've got a premium plugin that you built and you know it's successful is it easy to kind of retrofit and create a free version from it or does that kind of not ever work because you know that you're going to be just taking away features or is it just best to start from scratch with a plugin that's free Mm. put it on .org, build it, and keep adding features until you think, right, I'm at a point now where this is, this should be a premium feature, and then you can put it into the premium version, and then at that point it's growing. But it is it is a difficult decision. I do think that maybe historical or plugins in the past that have done well in the freemium model, like that have got the free versions and then got add-ons, um, it's, it's, e- it's been easier for them in the past maybe, but it, yeah. it does depend on what the kind of plugin it is because, you know, like Ninja Forms, for example, it was always a free version on .org mm-hmm. and they added pro features add, add, as add-ons and that kind of model works because they've created their own core version and they can add new functionality as just premium add-ons. Yeah. Um, but that's suited well, to that type of plugin. It's like WooCommerce as well, isn't it? Their the whole yeah. model is... You know, WooCommerce yeah. is free, but they make their money from the add-ons. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then the, the flip side to that is Ninja Forms. You know, the biggest competitor to them is Gravity Forms, which has never been a free version. It's always been premium. You know, it's the original WordPress premium plugin. Uh, and I think they, when you speak to people and and hear Carl Hancock talk on Twitter, like they completely spurn the WordPress repo. They don't think it has any value they don't like the way it's run and the way the search algorithm works and they don't like the rating system or how 
you know somebody could leave you a one star review because they don't you don't give them support yeah. which is you know wholly unreasonable because of course you can't support every person with a free plugin when it's a lot of people you know it's their free time but then to to give you a one star rating actually affects your your sort of rank in the search results so therefore yeah. it affects your plugin and potentially your premium version um so they they don't people don't like the wordpress repo for that reason and of course gravity forms has become successful just without it yeah. so there are people who think you can just do a premium version and only and probably right now start a new one and you'll become successful but i i do worry that that isn't necessarily the case because you know they've been there and done it and like is there a bit of survivor bias on that because yeah. they are where they are and how many people yeah. have tried premium plugins only and not gone anywhere kind of thing yeah i guess it's hard to tell isn't it you know like so they they were part of it is at the right time at the right place back then they were the first to there and exactly. but there's nothing to say yeah. that that wouldn't work now for the right product i assume is this so yeah it's interesting yeah and wp rocket did it in 2014 which is uh, you know not as old as gravity forms and they still have become yeah. wildly successful so yeah, yeah. it's it depends, as always. Yeah. Ian, do you have any specific tips for uh, success in the repo, in the WordPress repo? I know it could be a potential place to pitch a product of yours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, as you yeah, mentioned, pluginrank.com is my sort of SaaS product, another side product that helps people understand how their plugin is ranking in search results in WordPress.org mm -hmm. because, you know, if you've got users inside their own WordPress dashboard that want to search for a membership plugin, they will type it in, membership plugin. They won't know which one they want. And obviously, WordPress surfaces results and probably gives you the first 20 or 40. And how yeah. many users are, are going to be selecting anything bar, you know, below the first 10? Um, so trying to increase your position is, is helpful if you have a premium offering and you want to obviously make money and create the best... Um, or, or make the most of that channel of marketing with yeah. being on wordpress.com or .org even. Um, yeah, it's the best thing is is support, keeping on top of support, because even though you might think, oh, I put this out for free, it's a free plugin, I can't support users as well. But you know, in black and white, it is a ranking algorithm factor. So if you don't reply to support, that will affect you. Whereas if you kind of keep on top of the support, resolve support, you will get a boost in the rankings. Higher ratings, so mm. it's coupled with support. If you go yeah. out your way and help somebody and give them good support, fix their problem, whatever, they will probably more than likely, and you could ask them for a rating, and that in, you know helps your um, helps your uh, exposure on the repo, um, and all of that then is going to help hopefully tie into more people using your plugin which then will um also help as well cool. so yeah i think i think you can't just create it deploy it release it on wordpress.org and forget about it you've got to look after it and you've got to um you know respond to people and, and try and grow it by you know taking care of it yeah okay that's good thank you we've we've had a few uh, questions come in uh, a lot of them actually about finances and, and money so i think we're going to come on to that in a second uh, but we probably should move on to the, the the tech side of things keith next i think um i just had one more thing mark i know all oh, right sorry on the tech side but just uh pricing i thought would was be good to touch on um in terms of so we've kind of talked a little bit about a kind of pricing model or in terms of like freemium um but how do you come up with an actual price uh for for your product um james i'll go to you for that yeah it is tricky um i mean the starting point is obviously going to be to evaluate uh similar products in the marketplace um also it, it touches on what i said before um about whether your product adds value or you know generates value for the the customer you can charge a higher price point for that kind of product um or if your product is the kind of essential component to what they're building um you know people will pay more for that kind of product uh but it is it is tough i i think it's a it, it's never a set in stone thing i think yeah. you can 
you don't need to set your price and stick to it forever. You can kind of uh, adjust it as as time goes on. Um, what what I tend to do is anyone that's bought it already and has an active subscription will maintain whichever price they've paid for it. Um, I I don't tend to increase their prices because I know as a person I I don't like it when companies do that to me. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't experiment. Uh, mm. And you can do A-B tests as well. So you can have the same page serve up two different prices and see which one performs better. Um, and there's always going to be you know, some kind of sweet point uh, in, in terms of a price. And then you've also got the kind of psychological side to it of using nines and fours. Um, you know, 40, 49 is more appealing than 50. Um, so yeah that, that would be my advice good stuff Ian yeah very similar to James I think the psychology side of it if you value your your product low I think people see that as not a valuable product like it's that psychology aspect that if you if it's a higher price thing people think oh you know this is something that I need this is something that's um, that's going to be worth that money um, mm. and yeah again just to reiterate it's like James said it's not set in stone change it um, like for example when um, when I acquired WP user manager which just some context is a free plugin with add-ons you know it's the ninja forms model it's the easy EDD model um, the plugins the add-ons were being sold some were $19 for a single site license and some were 39 and that was the highest price so like an, an average order from a customer would be thirty nine dollars, yeah, which is kind of feels low. Um, and ever since then, I've ju- I've just been periodically raising prices, and that has come alongside adding more add ons and in- adding bundles of add ons, but experimenting with the fact that somebody could go and buy a bundle for now two hundred ninety nine dollars, which gives them all of the add ons. They might not need all of the add ons, but it might be cost effective, um, and raising the price of the individual add ons. Like that's completely changed how what sort of my revenue looks like um, in terms of average order value, you know, monthly revenue, and it's completely different. And and actually, the add-ons themselves haven't changed the whole deal. I've added yeah. more add-ons, hmm. uh, maybe in, improved a little bit, but it's they're the same things. So it's yeah, do uh, do not be afraid to kind of change it and tweak it and experiment. Mark. Um, here we have a question from Tom Hurst, uh, kind of linked to the, the money side of things and, and prices. Um, Tom's been on the show, actually, and he says, Hi, all. have you ever picked up a correlation between the price paid for a plugin and the customer's expected level of support for it, which kind of links a bit what you were saying then, Ian, in that if it's not high enough, it feels like they don't value it. So I just wondered if, uh, if you could answer that, Ian. Yeah, and I've definitely... I've seen it from customers and I've also seen it from myself, which is a weird way weird way to describe it, but I'll explain. Like if someone comes in, especially when I first introduced like the higher or a bundle plan that was like a higher price, so two hundred dollars or three hundred dollars as it is now, when people buy that, if they resp- if they have support issues, I need to I feel like I need to support them probably above and beyond because it's a big chunk of money that's just come my way. Um and and so therefore, I think I need to look after this customer. And similarly, when I added a lifetime plan, so people were paying like two and a half times the um, the annual license point. So it was like $599. Those people kind of expect expect quite a lot, I think. Mm. Um, I've had instances where people, you know, they'll come with support questions. It might be like a, a bug or something they weren't quite understanding. And you fix it, and then they come back with, oh, now I've got you. Can I ask this, this, and this? And it might be actually really generic WordPress questions. And you're like, hang on, I could Google this for you, or you could Google it, or but yeah, it's not actually to do with the plugin. But you still feel a bit indebted to, to help them out. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it does happen. But then you also do get customers that never ask you for support, uh, similar licenses. So it swings and roundabouts. But I think it's tied into WordPress people who think, they are entitled to lots because the majority of WordPress is free. The majority of the plugins are free. So when they pay some money, they think they should get everything kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. James. Yeah. I think, um, 
another thing to consider is uh, the higher price your plugin is, the less customers you're going to get. So you could get, um, for the same amount of money, less support load with a higher price plugin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it is kind of true that people that pay more for a product often want less support than people that pay less or get it for free. Um, and they're usually more understanding with uh, the, the kind of boundaries of your support. Um, you know, we, we don't do any custom development. We'll advise them to uh, go to Codable if they want extensive mm. customer de uh, custom development. We do do, um, <clears throat> we'll provide snippets and, and, you know, kind of PHP, you know, like a quick hook or something. Um, but yeah, they're, they're kind of more understanding uh, the more they've paid. Like we, we have bundles as well. Um, we've our all access bundles four nine nine a year. Um, and like Ian said, we do feel like we need to kind of tend to them with priority because um, they're, they're obviously a high value customer. Uh, and, yeah. But I mean, they tend they don't tend to ask as many questions as uh, even you know pre sales. Yeah, I think in our limited experience, we've seen similar uh, to to you two. So uh, so yeah, absolutely. Should we move on to the tech? Keith, go f go for it. Um, so we just wondered. Obviously, um, we've we've mentioned Easy Digital Downloads, our sponsor for this uh, for this show. They uh, offer an excellent service for selling digital products. Uh, we just wondered what what you guys use to manage your subscriptions and and possibly licenses and plugins and, and that sort of stuff. So uh, maybe you could let us know how you how you handle that, Ian. Yeah, I, I use ED, EDD Easy Digital Downloads um, on the WP user manager site. Um, and I, yeah, I use it similar to use the license, uh, the licenses and the like recurring, um, yep. add on. And that's good. Like it, it's kind of the original way to sell downloads and WordPress. It feels like it's, um, it's the way to do it. It, it doesn't come without its challenges. I think, especially as a UK seller with VAT in the mix, you know, it's, it, it handles us tax as well and all of that stuff. But, uh, I'm using a plugin from Barn2 that is the EU VAT plugin to make that a bit easier. But yeah, to be honest, it, because when you're talking about easy digital downloads, you're talking about having your own e-commerce system or you know on your site. So along with your plugin that you're managing and selling, you've got to you sort of maintain your e-commerce platform. You've got to make sure all the updates are on working. Um, and handle the taxes and make sure that's all um, working correctly. So that it, it's easy, but it's not easy at the same time to manage your own e-commerce stuff. Um, but yeah, it's it works well. Yeah, it's certainly certainly like straightforward isn't the word I think, but uh, you know plugins like Easy Digital Downloads and others out there, I'm sure, make it a lot easier than it could be for sure. Definitely, um, James. What do you use for yours? Um, I use Freemius. So Freemius is, uh, they are the merchant of records. So they handle the licensing, the checkout flow, um, basically, you know, everything, the abandoned cart, uh, user database and everything like that. So they will process the payments for me. Um, they'll handle all the VAT stuff so I don't have to worry about it. Uh, they do subscriptions. And then on a monthly basis, they'll pay me whatever I've earned the previous uh, yep. month and a half before, um, which works really nice. And that, that's what I was looking for when I was moving away from Code Canyon. Uh, Code Canyon, where obviously they, they handle things in the same way. They pay you monthly uh, as a vendor, so you don't have to worry about VAT. Um, and I was looking for someone to handle that for me because I didn't want the... Uh, I didn't want to worry about the setup of my e-commerce side yeah. of things. Um, there's pros and cons to it. Um, you know, freemius obviously take a percentage of the sales. Um, and you're also kind of limited in terms of your branding. Uh, 
for actual um, emails that get sent out, transactional emails and uh, account areas and things like that. Um, but they are improving that side of things. And is that is that mean that the checkout process happens off your site on the servers, or is that still on your site? It's a bit of both. Um, right. it, it's uh, it's like an embedded checkout. So right. when someone clicks to buy or take a trial on one of our products, you get this modal that pops up, uh, which is essentially an iframe uh, to a secure checkout on Freemius's site. Um, and you get the ability to kind of stylize that uh, with your own CSS. So it's it's heavily branded towards what my site looks like anyway. Yeah. Good, good. Um, anything else to add on that, Keith? No, not not particularly. Um, you handle most of the tech stack for That's us, right. Mark. I don't know if you like. Do you have any insights from what from what we've done? Because I don't I don't get involved too much, but. No, not not massively. Uh, similar to Ian, really. Obviously, we use easy digital downloads, um, yeah, and which has worked really well for us. Uh, we 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 have the all the all access pass, like like uh, Ian mentioned, they do bundles of products, and we use quite a lot of them, so it makes sense to to buy all the sort of the bundle mm. together, and that works well. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's all, all good on that aspect. Super interesting to hear James talk about a kind of. Uh not having to worry about tax and yeah, all the VAT yeah. stuff because yeah. that could be a real pain. That, that's, that, that, that was basically true. my my only requirement when I was looking for a solution was yeah. that it has to handle the, the tax for me. But you, there, there comes a point um, which you know we, we hit uh, a while ago where it's potentially more cost effective to just hire someone to manage your e-commerce site for you uh, and you right. know handle the VAT and, and things like that. Mm because you you're paying the same in commission anyway so yeah mm. yeah i um, mean the the vat side of stuff isn't sorry mark it isn't uh, very easy at the moment i mean yeah to mm. to manage it yourself is is still a hassle like you've got uk vat and then vat moss that was and now without with brexit i'm now registered in ireland to do my vat moss returns and i'm now navigating a whole different process and system to do that and it's just like I don't know why I waste a day every month or every three months doing it, but mm. yeah, it seems you are where you are, and you just continue, don't you? Very complicated. Yeah, Andreas just mentioned there that the EU VAT system is bonkers and the UK VAT system is too difficult, etc. I think we can all probably yeah. agree that it's quite complicated um, for sure. Um, I just wanted before we move on to the next bit, I just wanted to get uh, one question which I thought was interesting from uh, Prashant, and he mentions how do you protect your plugins from pri- uh, from piracy? I thought was an interesting uh, question, um, James. What do you think? Maybe that you don't. Maybe that you do. Is there anything that you do? Yeah. That? The the simple answer is you you don't really. Um, there's, I've I've got thoughts on this. So, Freemius, uh, they protect it more so than you would see in other products. I I think um, they have the ability to disable the plugin. If you don't have a valid license, okay. Um, now that doesn't really protect it from piracy because you could quite easily just modify the code and strip that out, which is what people do do. Um, you know, you, you our products are on tons of GPL sites. Um, I th- I think to be honest, you kind of just have to ignore the GPL stuff uh, as long as someone's not actively saying that they are you and they're trying to sell the product as if they were you, uh, yep. which would obviously be an issue. Um, but the, the value that the customer's getting um, is the support that you offer, the fact that you're the one developing the product and you're going to be adding you know, the features that they need, mm-hmm. uh, and also that they're definitely not going to get any malware, which... Um, is quite often the case on these GPL sites. Uh, and if you just explain to the customer about that, they tend to say, oh, okay, yeah, I'll buy it from you. A lot of, a lot of customers, if they're not technical, don't even realize that a GPL site is a ripoff of your product. Um, so when they do come to you for support and you say, you know, you bought it from a GPL site, we, we can't support you, they don't realize that they've done that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a lot about education. Uh, one thing that we did last year, 
potentially the year before, was to create um, landing pages for, for example, like WooThumbs nulled um, to kind of target those keywords so that when people are searching for it, they'll come to that landing page and we'll basically explain why it's a bad idea. Um, I, I don't necessarily know that it converts particularly well, but it, it felt a, a good opportunity to, to do that. Just to confirm, GPL sites are uh, websites that are offering these plugins because they are released under the general public license, so essentially anyone can do anything they want with them. Um, just just to make sure if anyone that's watching doesn't know, listening doesn't know that. Um, have you anything to add? Yes, yeah, so they'll, they'll, so they'll, buy, they'll buy the plugins from the vendor uh, at full price. Yep. Usually uh, it, it's a good case for not offering unlimited licenses as well because that's something that they could do is buy that and sell the licenses to save themselves the effort of modifying the code um but yeah they'll, they'll buy it uh from the vendors and then they'll resell it at like five dollars or right. a lot of them have subscription where you pay you know twenty dollars a month and you get access to Lots all of them. woocommerce's uh suite of plugins um so yeah that's what they do ian have you anything to add on piracy and protecting it or anything yeah, I mean, it's nothing I come across too much with my own plugins in terms of I don't think they're popular enough to kind of get to those levels of GPL clubs, but we've seen it at Delicious Brains, and I think it's just a case of not giving them any oxygen, and there's not much you can do about it, but when you do get the customers who have picked up an old version of the plugin mm -hmm. and then think that they can get support from you, it's frustrating, but I think you can put put them right and just, yeah, try, try not to... Um, Try not to waste that energy on it. I think any more than uh, yeah. a bit. Yeah, a bit of education as well. Thinking to make them aware of what they've what they've got and what they can't then have. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah normally it works. <laughs> Where are we going next, Keith? Well, we're, we're we've hit the hour mark, so I don't want to push it too too much further. But there were a couple of topics that I kind of wanted to touch on. Um, Again, one is uh, support, which we've covered a little bit, but I want to dig in just a little bit more into that. And then the second is just uh, trends in the in the marketplace. Um, so we'll come to that at the end. So on, on the support topic, um, quite often when Mark and I are trying to think of an idea for a plugin or, or wonder whether something's worthwhile uh, producing and putting out there, we think about the potential support costs because that's obviously one of the, the big costs of, of a plugin business. Um, and it really it can really put us off. You know, you, th you think, okay, I'm going to sell this for X per month or per year, and we expect probably an hour or two per year per customer kind of thing. What's the reality? And what, like, you guys both have you know fairly successful plugins. Um, how, what is the support load on you? Uh, is there a is there a formula you can use? Does it just completely change uh, depending on the product? Um, how, how do you kind of factor that in whenever you're you're trying to make decisions about whether to launch something or not, James? Yeah, like you say, it depends on the product. Um, but there's so many variables with WordPress stuff that you, they could be using your product on multiple different types of servers with different plugins. There's always going to be support. Um, yeah. I, I think if you're starting out with it, it's important to do the support yourself, at least for a while. Because you get you get to communicate with the customer, which they like. You know, they like to speak to the person who's actually building the product. Um, but you also can analyze your conversations and realize where people are tripping up with your product and improve. You know, the, the processes that got them got them to that point to avoid it happening in in future. Yeah. Um, so I think there's you know, with with my products, I think I supported them for five or six years um, without hiring anyone. Uh, but at this point, we hire uh, we use a company called Level Up, uh, Level Up dot support, um, and they're just you know exceptionally good. They assign you a specific agent or you know one or more, um, so you've got the same person doing your support every time uh, they're based in the philippines so they're they're very cost effective for people in the uk or the us and um, probably yeah. other areas of europe um and i would say we spend under two thousand pounds a month and they handle all of the first tier support for us 
Um, so there's definitely like a, a period where you should be doing it yourself, I think. Yeah. Um, and then once you've got the revenue, that you don't really have an issue to start paying for that support, um, at least to you know channel the more basic questions to the right places. Yeah. Do you have a, do you have um, a sense of like what percentage of your revenue you assign to support uh, approximately across your products? That's um, a leading question now. He's just told you 2,000 yeah. support. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> One percent. No uh, comment. Thanks. No comment. I, I couldn't say because we, no, right. we have the first tier support and we also have you know technical support, which yep. myself and my developers do as well. Um, but I, like probably 50% of our time is spent on support um, plus 100% of the level up time on support. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's a big part of our business model. I think having good support is what's going to make you last. So it's definitely something you should consider before releasing yeah. a product. That's great. Thanks, James. Um, Ian, anything to add on, on the support topic? Yeah, I, th I think in answer to your question that you're obviously asking each other when you're thinking, I don't think the perceived or potential burden and cost of support should ever be a blocker to releasing a product from your side. I think you know, initially do the support and get the, you know, the bug reports that are, you know, support is legitimate that you're going to then fix it or get feature requests or, you know, I think it's a, it's a valid thing to, to have. Um, and obviously, yeah, you can, it changes over time and it changes per product. But um, like, as James said, you can optimize things, you can op optimize the product, you can optimize the documentation, you can optimize because of support. So I, I think there's definitely a concept or or a perception that it's a negative thing, but for the most part, it's something that is going to improve your product and yeah. differ, differentiate you from competition. It's also where you get a lot of your positive feedback from. Yeah, yeah. testimonials, and, and that that in itself is is rewarding and kind of makes you want to keep doing it. Yeah. So on on that, so if someone comes to you. And actually what they're requesting you would regard as kind of irrelevant to the product or service that you have provided. So complete learning scope. Lee, and you mentioned it before, I think um, lots of people, once you sold them a WordPress product, they want you to solve all their WordPress ills. Uh, how do you like, how do you handle that? Like, is there, a, do you have like a l nice little one liner and like, a little polite thing to say, to say, sorry, this is you know not included? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And it's canned responses. But also, it's a grey area because sometimes it might be something that I think, oh, do you know what? That would be good for users, for other users of the plugin. But I've already I only had one person request it. So I might note it down. I'll just say, look, I'll keep this in mind, but it's not going to happen right now. Yeah. Um, but I, th I think for me, the other thing that's helpful is like WP User Manager is heavily customizable. You know, there's lots of uh, filters and hooks in there that it is possible to probably do what they want. And I just have to say, look, this is out of the scope of support. I'm afraid it would be custom development. And this is where you can go and get a developer or ask your developer. Um, mm. But yeah, it, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything wrong with being upfront about it. Like, you know, this isn't something that we're going to look at. It's not on our roadmap, um, yeah. but it, you know, this is the way you could go and get it done. Yeah. That's goodbye for now. Yeah. That's great. James. Yeah, I think it's important to frame your conversations with the customer as well that you are working with them. So you're saying, uh, so for example, if there's a third party plugin conflict, rather than saying you need to go back to your other developer and tell them this, you say uh, something along the lines of, you know, we need to reach out to your uh, the, the other developer of the plugin. Uh, and when they get back to you, we can then figure out uh, yeah. how we can solve the issue so you kind of you're not putting the blame back onto them which is when they could start to become a bit confrontational yeah um so you need to frame it in a way that you're working with them to get them the best result rather than kind of dismissing them to to something else yeah that's great thanks guys last last big question then um what are the significant trends uh, in the premium uh, plugin market? Um, Ian, I'll go to you first on that. Um, I think there's two ways to answer that question because 
when you talk about trends, like we've we've talked around ideas for plugins and and the way the business like the market's going, but also um, and we've also talked about it trends in how we sell the plugins. Um, so like James I think mentioned earlier, like it used to be everybody selling like one off purchases, like you'd, yeah. you'd sell a, a eight dollar license and it'd be lifetime, whereas now it's moved to yearly um, subscriptions. It used to be manual renewals, and then now pretty much everybody has automatic renewals that have to be cancelled by the, the customer. Uh, there was a, a time when everybody offered renewal discounts, and I think that's less and less now. Like, mm-hmm. There's a lot of lot of, sort of trends that have been set by bigger plugin companies like WooCommerce, I think, were the first to stop renewal discounts, and it created a major hoo-ha in the community. But actually now that's like just a given, yeah. and you know, you're still having to support the plugin going forward. Um, and I think the the trend that's sort of happening at the moment is, uh, and it's similar to what Freemius are doing in, in terms of locking features when uh, a license has become expired or cancelled or refunded or whatever, because there's this history where, because the code's GPL, you're selling, you're not selling the code, but you're selling access to support and you're selling access to updates to that code. Um, but actually to try and say, well, if you don't keep paying for the license, you won't be able to use the plugin to the full potential that's becoming more and more prevalent i think and it's going to be something that more plugin companies do i mean i'm not not personally doing that myself but i can see it happening around me and i'm thinking that that feels like the more sort of SaaS model approach and the the shopify side which james was saying um so that's i think that's definitely a trend that's that's happening um and in terms of just quickly in terms of business ideas and what plugins are being built i think you know james is a prime example of woocommerce the ecosystem around woocommerce is massive um and e-commerce is only going to get bigger so sort of hitching your wagon to something like woocommerce and building plugins for that or even other big plugins like learning plugins are big um yeah and just going in that direction and not trying to create your own um trying to create your own product that has to have its own market just sort of hook onto one that exists and and keep going from there that's great james yeah i think just going back to the uh trend of kind of locking features um with freemius that's optional uh in most circumstances but there are times when you when you'd want to do that so for example we offer 14 day free trials uh so if someone takes a trial they use the plugin for 14 days and then decide not to renew if we didn't have some kind of locking feature then they would still just be able to use the plugin like regardless yeah um so the ability to lock in in that scenario is quite nice but we do after a year if they don't renew they get to use the plugin um in its current state they just don't get updates or support that's that's how we handle it cool that's great um we've done a long time i think we should probably wrap things up really um so before we do um james where can people sort of find out more about you and maybe follow you uh, on the web yeah uh i'm on twitter at james c kemp uh but also at iconic wp uh website is iconic wp.com very good thank you and ian what about yourself yeah i'm um at pole vault web on twitter and pobotweb.com which has got a link to all my sort of stuff on there so yeah excellent highly recommend you head on over there and uh, follow these guys particularly if you're selling wordpress plugins obviously um i'd like to give another big thank you to our sponsor easy digital downloads if you are looking to sell wordpress plugins and or themes i guess online or digital products then really go and check them out at easydigitaldownloads.com uh, it's a great solution And again, please do subscribe to the High Rise Digital channel to make sure you don't miss out on any of our content. And we look forward to bringing you the next episode, which is a big one. It is on May the 10th at 5 p.m. British Summer Time. That is 4 p.m. Universal Time, where we're going to be joined by Matt Mullenweg and Josepha Chomfossi. I beg your pardon if I've said that wrong, Josepha. Um, And we're going to talk about the future of WordPress. So if you've got any questions that you want to ask to Matt and Josepha, then please... uh, get in touch on Twitter, uh, ask them on there, and we will uh, be publishing that video uh, 
shortly on YouTube so you can obviously uh, add it to your reminders. Thanks so much again to our guests Ian and James for being so generous with their time and we thank everyone who tuned in to listen either on the podcast or on YouTube and we will see you next time. <laughs>